James Kay is here, fresh from Chicago Sky Practice. Lockdown Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Well, happy Friday, everybody. I am Howard Magdal, founder and editor of The Next and host at Lockdown Women's Basketball. Very excited that you have decided to make us your first listen every day. Lockdown Women's Basketball is free and available wherever you get podcasts. And we are just one week away from the first games of the WNBA season. So James Kay, who is our beat reporter for the Chicago Sky over at the next is great work. Other places too, the Chicago Tribune. James, it's great to see you one week out. How is how close to ready is this Chicago Sky team? It's crazy. There's <laughs> the thing about it is that the team has had so many players come through. They have the highest amount of training camp contracts um in the league in coming into this uh, preseason and 87, just, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think you might be even underselling it there. Um, no, but like it, it is starting to feel like now that we're a week away that, you know, we're seeing Courtney Vandersloot and Allie Quigley pick up their, pick up their reps a little bit. We're seeing Emma Misa and Azra Stevens going at it in practice and also being in the same lineup. It's just been, it's been great seeing the intensity ramp up over the last week and a half since I've been at practice every day. So it's been great. I've been glad that the WNBA season's back because I've been ready for it since the Sky's Championship Parade. <laughs> Me both. <laughs> and so you talked about Courtney and Allie, but it does seem like that's a critical difference, that typically you see them come from overseas. There's a delay. This is not just prioritization, of course. This is, uh, let's say, an, a, a happy subset reaction to what is a deeply unsettling uh, thing that is happening with war overseas. But from that positive perspective, you know, taking opportunity out of crisis, it does seem like uh, in a narrow way that that's a helpful thing for Chicago. Is that how you see it? Definitely. And giving those two rest before the season, where instead of them coming in from winning a championship like they did at UMMC last year, um, and then just immediately going to the United States, trying to get ready for a season and then try to go on a championship run, which when you bring in Candace Parker, that is the ultimate goal, no, no matter what um, expectations you had the season before. So, yeah, they they look great in practice. They've been super vocal, which I mean, I've heard about Ali Quigley being vocal in practice. Um, I, I hadn't had a chance to actually be there before this season. And she's just been taking every guard under her wing same thing with Courtney Vandersloot. Um, they've really kept things light, but also made sure that everybody knows what the expectation is in training camp as they try to become the first team since, I believe, 2002 to win back-to-back -back championships in the WNBA. So it's been a great balance between that competitive fire and just keeping things light. Such a hard thing to do in this league, for sure. But having effectively coaches on the floor is a really interesting way for them to go about it. Now, I just wonder, and, and I don't know if you've talked to them about this, but are they fresher than they otherwise would have been? Do you see a difference in terms of the legs as they come in there? You know, just being able to have some extra time off and ramp up in a normal training camp, I would think would uh, provide some benefits, you know, certainly on the physical side as well. Well, <laughs> Courtney Vandersloot, no matter if she's at 50% or 100%, just looks like she's the best point guard in the league anytime she steps out on the floor she really hides her her injuries pretty well. I mean, she tore – I forget exactly what she tore um, in the first game of the WNBA Finals, but she played through it. And she could have been the Finals MVP if it sure. wasn't for Kalia Copper going bonanza. But, um, yeah, I mean, she honestly has looked great from the onset. Allie Quigley actually hasn't been made available to practice uh, in front of the media, mm -hmm. but I think they're load managing her. Courtney Vandersloot told me two days ago, or I guess it would be three days ago, that they didn't want to make the same mistake as last season where, again, they rushed to get back home and then get things going where Allie Quigley played in the season opener, but then she was out the next few games with a hamstring injury that lingered. 
they are trying to manage her right now so that she is fresh for the 2022 season, which is going to be, I mean, one of the most important seasons for the Chicago Sky in franchise history. It is. And again, it's not just a WNBA season. It is a very compressed WNBA season where there was a lot of talk last year. Look, we need people. And this wasn't just Chicago, but throughout the league, we need people fresh by middle of September into October. Well, last day of the regular season is August 14th this year because of the international calendar. So it is something of a hurry up to get ready so that you can uh, manage things. I, I do wonder whether you see some more minutes restrictions in the same way that we have seen, you know, Nikki Collin did that really well with the Atlanta dream when she was here, uh, taking it directly, quite frankly, from what the San Antonio Spurs did on the NBA side. But if any team is a candidate for that, it's a team with so many important players in their thirties from uh, Vander Quiggs to uh, Candace Parker as well. Uh, do you, do you expect that? Do you think we'll see fewer minutes per game out of them? Not just a question of load management where people will miss a game here and there. I don't know if it's going to be about them missing games necessarily, but they're not going to be playing 30, 35 minutes a game the way that they were down the stretch. Um, there was one point where Allie Quigley was paying, playing like 32, 35 minutes a game. Courtney Vandersloot last season at one point was playing the most minutes per game in her career, which yeah. when you have <clears throat> all those miles that they've accumulated since they got to the league, it's just, you want to give them some, a breath of fresh air and, one of the things that I think is just going to be super crucial for them is having Julie Alleman, who is going to be able to back up both of them. She is a combo guard that can spot up for you, but also create for her teammates. Getting her this offseason, I think, is actually one of the most underrated moves in the WNBA offseason, quite frankly. She's someone that she's also, she's a future piece for them. If Courtney Vandersloot decides she doesn't want to play in the WNBA next year to take some rest off, um, it would be out of her character to do so just because she's so competitive. But Julie Alleman is like going to contribute to this team immediately. And I, I really could see her playing 25 minutes a game just to give Sloot and Allie Quigley some time to really ramp up to this season because they did take some time off after coming back from Russia. It just, it's a great point about Julie Alleman. And, and to me, people focused a little bit on the turnovers when you looked at her first year in the league. To me, there are multiple caveats to that. First of all, it's her first year playing in the WNBA. For another, she was playing on a 2020 fever team that simply did not have continuity of any sort, which makes things very difficult in terms of a playmaker. She still had a very solid assist percentage. And the biggest thing for me is she shot 47.8% from three on greater than four attempts per game. Uh, shades of Ali Quigley in those numbers as well. So having her as an opportunity to back them up both and potentially at times be able to be a starter feels like something you're not going to be able to miss a beat. Does she seem to have the quickness you think required to be a frontline uh, guard in this league? Absolutely. She's someone that I was super high on even going into 2020. She's really just a pro. I mean, I think she's one of the only players. I think she's the only rookie ever to average eight points, five rebounds and like six assists per game in one season. Like, She's someone that can do a lot for you. Ann Waters, who's the new assistant coach on the sky, is someone who told me the other day that Julie is so excited to get to Chicago. She's someone that's going to love the atmosphere in Chicago, just given how everyone works so hard. And she's antsy, Howard. She's so antsy right now because she even asked Ann if she could give a play to Julie just so that she can get going on the season so that when she gets here – and Anne's like, you know what, you got to take care of business in France. We'll, we'll figure it out once you get here. But that's the kind of player that Julie Alleman is. She's someone that really wants to hit the ground running wherever she goes. And she wants to win so freaking bad. And when you have a player like that coming into this environment, like there's just not enough, like there's just a perfect fit for her coming into, um, you know, coming into this locker room. It's going to be fascinating to see, and I'm, I'm very excited that she is not only in a role at the lead, but with a team where I think she's going to play some vital minutes down the stretch. So I'm really going to be fascinated. I want to get into some of the standouts who uh, are excelling in camp and are very much in the conversation as we face some interesting roster decisions. But we're going to pay some bills first, and we're going to start by talking to you about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. 
Find all your latest sports developments, lead reviews and news, including this year's basketball playoffs, start a major league baseball season. And critically, from my view, WNBA odds, just like there was NCAA women's basketball odds during the collegiate season. If we are looking at truly quality and it's something we believe in very much at Lockdown Women's Basketball, that means making sure that there is equality in the sports wagering side of the sport of, of sports in general as well. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action for both men and women that online where the game starts. So the game is going to start for the sky over the last week of the season with a very big time center, somebody who has been with the Chicago sky was originally drafted by Pote Chapman Imani McGee Stafford. <laughs> and so you know, full disclosure, I just, you know, people need to know this. I've known Imani a long time. I've covered her since she was in school. Imani actually was a writer for High Post Hoops, the predecessor uh, of the next, and covered the 2017 WNBA draft with me. Our, our crew covering the 2017 WNBA draft uh, was uh, Meg Linehan, who's the fantastic women's soccer reporter at The Athletic now. Uh, congratulations, Meg, on winning the APSC Investigative uh, Award, by the way. Well deserved for her vital work on NWSL and Imani and myself. And we were the we were the trio. So I come into it hoping for Imani. I mean, the story, just the fact that she went to law school and is now coming back uh, is fascinating in and of itself. But take me through what you see about her, because I am also uh, a longtime admirer of her name on the court. So when I talked with James Wade a couple months ago, one of the things that stood out to me was that he said that Amani McGee Stafford's shooting ability is something that he's actually confident in. Like he said, I think the exact words were her, sh like her shooting form is fine. She's someone that we could see expanding her range. And she has kind of showed that a little bit in practice. Um, you know, she's not really shooting three pointers, which, have kind of been a prerequisite for any Chicago sky big, just as, just because they play five out and like to keep that space open for a player like Kalia copper to be able to get to the rim, um, mm -hmm. free up those lanes for her. So um, no, but she's been interesting. I mean, like I love her competitive spirit too. She's just somewhat, she's just a great person in general. I had a chance to catch up with her a couple days ago and um, yeah, I mean, she's, she's expanding her range a little bit. There was a play in the preseason where the, um, the help collapsed on the help defense collapsed on Emma Mieseman and she passed to Imani McGee Stafford right by the left free throw line extended. And she just hit like just catch and shoot. And it was a, you know, she swished it, you know, it was a perfect. Um, I mean, I think that was really indicative of like who she could be on the Chicago sky. You can't teach six, seven Howard. I think that's also one of the biggest things that we have to talk about here is because she is someone that could really be, useful to them when they face bigger teams in this league. When you go up against Liz Cambage, when you go up against Sylvia Fowles, one of the things they did last year was have a Stu fall who is no longer with the team. She's actually taking the WNBA season off. Mm -hmm. They had Stu do fall, just bump bodies with any big down low. Same thing with Steph Dolson, who's kind of a bruiser down low, even though she kind of has drifted out to the three point line a little bit. Um, but we'll see her more on the block with the, uh, with the Liberty, but um, yeah, I mean, th that's I, I do want to point out, by the way, Steph mentioned that last night or yesterday afternoon, I should say, at Liberty Media Day. She said, you know, I, I, I'm a really effective down low. Not everybody thinks so, but I'm going to show them this year. So so you are spot on on that. <laughs> Steph is ready to, to prove everybody wrong about that or at least those who said it. But go on. But that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, she, she I mean, she's been effective down there, so it doesn't surprise me. But Amani, I think, is someone that – she's you know she's still trying to get into game shape she she told me that she realized at um athletes unlimited that she was she realized that she needed to do more to get back into basketball shape and that she wasn't as quick as she was before she lost 30 pounds in the off season which mm -hmm. i think that when you're trying to get back into game shape i mean that shows what your work ethic is so um she wants to get back in this league I, at six seven she's really someone that could help this team I think that she does need to clean up some aspects of her game, though, just what I've seen in practice where maybe um, she just needs to get more reps in, you know, she just needs some more time and um, she could help this team. Definitely. She has the athleticism and maybe even the touch from um, 
again from 18 feet and out. So let's talk about the touch because what's fascinating about Imani is that in college, her head coach, Karen Aston, who again, point of personal privilege, I think was unjustly let go by University of Texas, uh, given the success she had developing players and routinely reaching the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. Uh, she also had her players prepared for the pros, by which I mean she had Imani shooting the ball mid-range and even out to three. I, I think there was a season where Imani was something like 12 for 28 from three at University of Texas. She hasn't gotten those reps at the pro level. And so getting the opportunity to get on the floor and being able to show that is something that is really the lone remaining stumbling block, as far as I can tell, to her being the type of stretch five this league needs. She is also, we didn't say, and it's so true, you can't teach six, seven, but it's not just six, seven. Her career block percentage is 4.6%. It would rank among the lead leaders. She is a solid rim protector, even in her limited minutes that she's had throughout this league. Now, Several regimes ago, or I guess it was one regime ago, but she was here in Chicago and she was basically asked to play the four next to Steph Dolson. And that's not really her game. And it doesn't need to be her game and it shouldn't be her game. But when you talked about her being next to Emma Meesman, well, my ears lit up because Emma as a four next to Imani at a five reminds me a lot of, by the way, Emma at the four next to Steph Dolson. At the five and suddenly and that was in D.C., but suddenly that starts to make a lot more sense. So just from like a roster crunch perspective, what is the pathway for Imani to be among that final group? It's really complicated because she is a veteran who's played at least three years in the league, which means she's going to be making just a touch over seventy two thousand dollars this year. The sky right as it currently stands, the sky can't roster someone at that price point and also an uh, even in just a regular rookie um who i guess it would be like around sixty thousand dollars sixty two thousand dollars something like that mm -hmm. and they, they would be just short of like a few hundred dollars in order to make that work i haven't talked to james wade about this it's something i've been kind of curious about um but they would have to do some financial maneuvering to make room like to have imani be on this roster just because mm -hmm. of that However, I think that if you think that this person is a difference maker, you can find a couple hundred dollars in, in order like in the cap room in order to make that work for you. And um, I think one person that we haven't even talked about is Lee Yaru, who is someone that we, we have no idea what's going on with her situation right now. Hopefully that she might be able to come over. So if, if James Wade thinks that Lee Yaru isn't going to come over this year and she's going to be on that rookie scale contract, maybe, I mean, they, maybe they suspend Lee Yaru and they have, Amani be that like fifth big. I think that there's a lot of value in that. And we've, again, we've seen how much James Wade just likes to have taller, um, taller bigs that are just able to counter some of the physicality of some of these other teams. And when you, you can't lose that when you're vying for a championship and when you get, when you play playoff basketball. So um, I think she could be a, a huge contributor on this team and she only needs to play five to 10 minutes a game. We're not asking like the sky are going to go to Imani and say, look, we need you to be a 25 minute per game player. It's like, no, just be an energy player for 10 minutes. If that, and there's a lot of value in that, especially trying to get through the regular season healthy, which is always their objective. It, it's critical. And she can absolutely help with that. Well, I'll be fascinated to see, like I said, you know, out of all the people who have written for me, I think Imani has the best chance of making the Chicago sky. And so, <laughs> Yeah, I'm offended by that, Howard. No, no, I'm going to say, our, our present company, definitely included, myself as well, but all the same, I we certainly would like to see no, notable alum of Monty McGee Stafford make it uh, as well. Also, I think the only one in camp with a law degree, so I would imagine that could come in handy as well. She's actually still in law school. So That's she right. She's went, not quite there yet. But well, yeah. she, she, she told me she changed track. So first she was doing like a two accelerated track. She, right. Her final isn't going to be done by the time the season opener happens. So that's just life of the WNBA is crazy, man. <laughs> it really is. It, it really is. Well, we've got a couple more to get to. We're going to pay mm -hmm. some bills, uh, but we're going to talk about Emma Meesman as well as a, a mystery player right after <laughs> this. But first, let's talk about Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of mates and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning 
and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts when you can do it yourself. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. You can save 30%, 50%, or even more over what a chain store or a car dealership is going to be able to take you. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, reliably low for every customer. So go to rockauto.com right now and see the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. So Emma Meesman, we know she can succeed in this league, to put it mildly. She's a finals MVP. <laughs> she has grown as a player. She's developed confidence. I still remember talking to her as a 19-year-old, new to this league, and trying to make her way forward with the Washington Mystics and trying to understand how good she was going to be. I think she gets it now. Uh, what kind of Emma Meesman are you seeing in Chicago Sky Camp, and how critical is she going to be to this Chicago team? So when I talked to Jen Hatfield, who covers the Washington Mystics for us, she said that, look, Emma's kind of reserved. She doesn't really open up to the media as much. And the first day I got – I'm sorry, Emma, I'm going to have to tell the story now. But um, the first day I, I saw her, we were coming out of practice, and I was like seven feet behind her. I was just on my phone. And she, uh, she trips in front of me. She turns around and she says, did you see that? And I say, uh, wait, what are you talking about? She said, oh, I just tripped. And I'm like, don't worry, I won't put that in my story. But I didn't say anything about podcasts, Emma. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I introduced myself and uh, I told her, like, you know, that Jen had covered her for many years and said great things about her. And she said, yeah. well, how could she not? <laughs> you know, this is the thing that I love about Emma Mieseman already is yes. that she just clearly has opened up her personality. And I coached, I talked to coach T and he said the same thing. Like she's just grown as a person where she just feels more comfortable about who she is. And we've seen that already in practice already. Like she's had a couple of veteran moments where, you know, she's put her hand around Ka Kathleen Doyle like, and talked to her about something. And um, she's keeping that energy up she's just such a different person than what I expected after I talked with coach T and Jen. And um, yeah, I mean, she's been electric <laughs> even on the court with her performance. So that's the kind of Emma Mieseman that the Chicago sky fan base is going to get accustomed to. She's growing up here. I mean, it, it really is, you know, you think about it to come to a new country at 19 and just how difficult that had to be. So I'm, I'm delighted to hear that she's so comfortable just on a, on a personal basis. But as a player, too, it does feel as if, and this is no knock on Steph Dolson, who's a very effective player, but in a lot of ways, Emma Meesman's going to replace Steph's minutes, it seems like, when you think about it. And Emma has a higher ceiling, if we're going just based on production in the league so far, even than Steph, who is a former All-Star. Yeah, and again, Steph Dolson was such an important part of this team over the last couple of years, especially from a chemistry standpoint where she became best friends with, or I should just say really good friends with, Courtney Vandersloot and Allie Quigley. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it is definitely an upgrade that, that Emma Meesem is going to be taking over those minutes. She's just a little bit more athletic. She kind of just fits the mold of what the Chicago Sky want to do. And again, Steph wants to be down the block. Emma kind of thrives outside of that. I mean, and she also, I mean, not to say that she's not a good post player. I mean, I, I mean, if you look at her advanced numbers on synergy, she's someone that can super effective around the rim as well. But um, yeah, no, Emma, my, I, I think that she's maybe missed four or five times in the, in the practices that I've seen um, during practice. I, she just doesn't miss. She scored 24 points in 26 minutes in the sky's first preseason game. And, yeah, Courtney Vandersloot said it best. Basketball looks easy when it comes to Emma. So it really does. It's she really raises their ceiling. North of thirty-seven percent from three for her career, and has a bunch of seasons over forty. It, it, it's going to be fascinating to see this James Wade offense with Emma Meesman in, in it. I'm really looking forward to it. Before I let you go, we got to talk about a player who we were having a conversation about beforehand, and I I, I flat out need to acknowledge so that our listeners, I hope, feel better as well. I cover the lead pretty closely and have for a long time, but there is somebody on the radar named Sparkle Taylor, and, and I just don't know about her game. I just don't. 
So take me through because you're saying it sounds like Sparkle Taylor is not just somebody in camp, but somebody who has uh, a legitimate chance to make this roster. So I spoke with James Wade about Sparkle Taylor yesterday, and she's someone that he called a walking bucket. Like he kind of lit up when talking about her. And I always take note when James Wade does that because, you know, I, I know that interviews just aren't the thing that he loves to do when he's like at camp trying to focus on his job, which 100% makes sense. He lit up when talking about Sparkle Taylor. He said he loves her scoring mentality. And he really made the point of like, she almost made the roster last season, like Hmm. on a championship roster that was, that had Candace Parker in it. The expectations were so high from a media perspective. And that was a team that was just going to be hard to crack a roster on just because of how the immediacy of um, their expectations of wanting to win a championship. Mm -hmm. And Sparkle Taylor, look, she struggled in that first preseason game against the Wings. Like defensively, it kind of seemed like she is still learning a few things on that end, um, at least in the Sky system. But she had her best practice yesterday. She's someone that was super aggressive trying to get to the rim. She can shoot. Um, And you know what? Sometimes the Sky need, especially in the second unit, they need someone that can just be like, you know what, guys, I got this. And um, that's a kind of mentality that I think James Wade values you know, she's not the tallest wing. She does, compared to Kayla Davis, I think, who just got to camp yesterday as well. She is someone that um, she's a little bit on the shorter side um, mm. and compared to Kayla Davis, who like has a couple inches on her. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just been crazy to see like James Wade talk about her this way. And I think she has a real shot to make the roster because she has been the only pure wing at camp so far. And Kayla Davis just got to Chicago and make $72,000. It's the same thing with the Monty McGee Stafford. It's going to be tough with Kayla Davis because of the amount of money that she's making, which is just the brutal reality of the WNBA right now. So Sparkle Taylor hasn't played a year in the WNBA. Makes um, the, will be making the minimum if she cracks the roster. I think she has a real good shot at backing up Kalia Copper, which is the sky's number one priority right now in figuring out. This is a regular theme on this show, so I will just point out once again, if we had 15 roster spots in the WNBA, if there was a WNBA G League, you just make the NBA comparison. You just think Imani Medi Stafford was built to go get 30 minutes a game, develop her game, show what she can do, and be a G League call-up. Sparkle Taylor is somebody who could be able to go and show what she's capable of down there. And instead, that's not going to happen for a handful of players in every single camp around this league once again. So I I understand why expansion is a difficult conversation. I do. I I don't really understand why the G League is quite the same level of conversation uh, as something that could really help the league and could uh, be a financial saver in a lot of ways by having these players here, having them ready to go. Um, And I very much think that it is short-sighted that there is neither a 15-player roster or even 13, just more than 12, and an injured list. I I just think these are short-sighted decisions uh, made by the league. It is so necessary to expand these rosters with how banged up a lot of these players come in after being overseas. And if you're, would you rather see Courtney Vanderson at 100% or at 80%? Like, Mm-hmm. Again, I, I just think about it in that perspective, like where you just able to give these players a little bit of breathing room to rest up playing one of the most difficult sports. And honestly, one of the sports that is just so taxing on your body. We need We need expansion. Um, but again, I know it's not a, a conversation that's going to be uh, you know, really. Um, I don't know. It, it, we just need to uh, veer away from Twitter when it comes to that conversation. Let's, uh, it's better to talk about it in this setting. So I just mean, you know, expansion yeah. requires a market, a place to play, and really well-capitalized owners, right? Expanding your rosters simply requires the owners that are already there to give a little more in what would ulti- ultimately pay for them many times over in a lot of different ways. So I'll keep banging the drum. I, I just seems very clear to me, but listen, everybody needs to go follow James K. Everybody needs to read his work at the next, especially about the sky where he has been a regular practice, where he's been getting interesting and informed perspectives on what this team is doing. James, I'm so glad you're aboard and I'm so excited that you're covering it for us. Uh, all the best to chat with you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Howard. This was great. Uh, Before I let you go, I did have one thing. 
this year would be crazy, but I, I think you, you need to know about it. Obviously, to our listeners, thank you for making Lockdown Women's Basketball your first listen every day. I have been informed that there is a men's basketball league also. Um, I wasn't sure if you had heard of it. It's true. It's true. It's called the NBA. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm apparently Chicago even has a team, the Bulls or something. So now make your second listen locked on NBA from the first jump ball of the play in tournament to the last possession of the finals. Locked on experts take you deep inside the playoffs. I'm, I kid, of course, there are wonderful NBA hosts who I've worked with and even folks like Tony East who uh, yeah. covers Locked On Pacers for Locked On NBA and covers the fever for us on the WNBA. Locked On NBA, very important that you make it our, your second listen for the day. Insight and analysis affecting all 30 teams. Once you've finished with Locked On Women's Basketball, we're here for you every day. Make sure you check out Locked On NBA too. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day.